part of the premise of the, the books and the television series is the fact that there are the, these entirely unpredictable seasons uh, and obviously it clearly matters to everybody economically, politically and just in terms of survival, knowing when winter's coming um, and the fact that it is a sort of great unknown in that society is something which sort of uh, hangs over everything that goes on. So yes, to know their variable in duration, so the seasons, they're unpredictable when they'll come and how long they're going to last for is completely unpredictable. There are two aspects to it. The main aspect to seasons on our planet is to do with the tilt of the Earth's axis. And when the Earth's axis is tilted towards the sun in the hemisphere you happen to be, whether that's north or south, then you're in summer, uh, partly because the days are longer and partly because the sun is sort of more directly illuminating, so you actually get more heat from the sun, so you warm up. And obviously as the Earth goes around the sun, one part of the year you're leaning towards the sun, you have summer, part of the year you're leaning away from the sun, then you have winter. That's the main aspect, then there's a slight secondary aspect, which is that the Earth's orbit is not exactly circular, and when the Earth is, uh, is closer to the sun, it's a little bit warmer, when it's further away, it's a little bit colder. And that actually, the point when you're closest to the sun actually occurs in January, um, and that's why summers in the southern hemisphere, which obviously are in full swing in January, are a little warmer than summers in the northern hemisphere, because that's the time of year when you're closest to the sun. So on Westeros, on the, the planet where Westeros is, you have these entirely unpredictable seasons, which means it must be something much more complicated is going on. And in particular, because it's unpredictable, what you're probably looking for, for is something which in the sort of mathematical sense of the world is chaotic. It is actually impossible to predict with, with great accuracy. I've been giving this a little bit of thought as to what might be responsible for such weird um, swings in the lengths of seasons and, and the, the intensity of seasons. And obviously, you know, we're talking about a fictional world here, so if you want, it can just be magic. Uh, but it would be nice to try and figure out if there can actually be a, some sort of scientific explanation as to what's going on. It could all just be down to geography. So I'm a little out of my comfort zone here as an astronomer, but uh, geographically, if you have features on your planet, um, they can actually have a, a, a strong impact on the climate of the planet. For example, um, you could have some fairly narrow seaway through which some important stream of warm water was traveling which was keeping your planet reasonably warm and so then if that fairly narrow passageway froze up that would then cut off the supply of warm water and then you get into this kind of positive feedback thing and actually that's a very common feature of these chaotic systems you have this kind of feedback whereby something which starts out quite small it just happens to freeze up that then makes everything much colder, which keeps it frozen, and so you have that kind of positive feedback, and it can be a long time before it could then uh, thaws out again, and you can start the next summer season. Like that, and you know, even in the, in the context of, of our world, you know, we're very worried um, about whether the Gulf Stream is going to shut off if the ice caps keep melting, and that could actually perversely have this strange effect of making uh, Western Europe extremely cold. And so you can have these very strange effects going on where reasonably small effects can then sort of amplify up the very big thing. So maybe the whole uh, winter thing is just down to geography from that point of view. That, yeah, that's kind of a dull explanation. So another terrestrial thing that could be responsible for it is if you had uh, um, a periodic volcanic eruptions, because we know that actually volcanoes on the Earth, when they throw large amounts of dust into the atmosphere, that can actually have a, an effect on the temperature. And so you could imagine a rather strange planet in which the seasons were dictated by whether or not there had been a recent volcanic eruption. And obviously, since we can't predict when volcanic eruptions are going to occur, that would then lead to these very random intervals between when winter happened. OK, so moving on to possible astronomical explanations. As I said, the tilt of the, of the axis of a planet is, at least in the case of the Earth, I think that's responsible for the, the, the seasons. And you could imagine if that tilt were actually wobbling around a place, then that would mean that the seasons would change in a really rather strange and unpredictable kind of way. And in fact, when we study the, the angles at which the uh, axes of the planets in the solar system are oriented, they do actually vary over time. The Earth famously does, but actually all the other planets do as well. And they actually do it in this chaotic way. They actually move around in a way which is very hard to predict. And so you could imagine that seasons are being driven by a planet in which that axis is tilting around very rapidly. The reason why this probably doesn't work is that if you think about it, you've got this spinning planet. What you've got to do is reorient that entire spin. So you've actually changed from a spin planet that's spinning like this to a planet that's spinning over like that. That's a huge amount of angular momentum. You've got to get shifted somewhere. So it has to be some interaction with some other body in the, in, in the, the stellar system in which this thing lives, the planetary system in which it lives. And transferring that amount of, of angular momentum 
And we have to do this on a time scale of just a few years because we want the winters to be lasting a year or two years or 10 years. So those kind of time scales, it probably doesn't work. But at least in theory, that's a way of, of getting seasons to change in a rather unpredictable way. The Earth's moon uh, actually suppresses this from happening. If you take the Earth's moon away, people have done calculations that showed that actually the, the, the Earth's tilt would become much more chaotic. The moon that we have actually suppresses uh, this effect to some extent. I believe that the, the planet uh, in these books actually has a moon as well. It's mentioned in some of the books from time to time. So possibly if this effect was going on, if there's a big moon there, that will probably suppress the effect anyway. So moving on to another possibility. Remember there are two aspects to the seasons here on Earth. The tilt of the axis is the primary one, but the secondary one is how far you are away from the star. And so you might imagine that that might be the thing that's driving the seasons on this, uh, this particular planet. You mean like a very elliptical orbit? You can do it. So the problem with a very elliptical orbit, if you have a very elliptical orbit, indeed, when the thing's close to the star it's orbiting, it'll be nice and warm, and then when it goes away, it'll get very cold. But the trouble with that is that that's entirely predictable, because the thing orbits around, you know, once per year. The year's length don't change. Kepler's laws keep it going around on a nice elliptical orbit. So if that were all that was going on, you wouldn't have, you might have seasons which were dictated by the distance, but actually those seasons wouldn't move around. They wouldn't vary in length from one year to the next. So what you need to do is come up with some way of messing with the orbit, making it so it's not just a normal ellipse. And the way you do that, well, you would get an ellipse when you have a planet that's going around one star. But if you had a binary star, two stars, and you put a planet in orbit around it, then the orbits get much more complicated and you can have, again, you can have chaos setting in and you can have the, the, the average distance between that particular planet and the stars will vary over time in a really rather complicated way. And again, that can lead to very unpredictable seasons. Professor, in a binary star system, does the planet go around one star or does it go around both stars or can it change stars? How does this even work? Yes, is the answer to that question. It can do any of those three things. So there's three possibilities here. You could, if you think about it, you can have the two stars relatively close together and then you can have the planet just orbiting around them. And that's a thing called a P-type orbit because it's just like a normal planet. You can have a pair of stars that are relatively far apart and obviously they'll be orbiting around each other, but then you can have a planet going around one of them. And that's a thing called an S-type orbit because it's behaving like a satellite of this thing. It's like a little moon of that star that's orbiting around the other star. Or you can have even more complicated things where the, the planet doesn't do one or the other. It kind of sometimes orbits one and then it'll cross over and orbit the other. Those are the most dramatic of all. They're very bad news indeed if you actually want to live on that planet because such an orbit will eventually go arbitrarily close to one of these stars and so it will get toasted. Um, so that's a bad kind of orbit to be in. But the other two types of orbit, you can probably have reasonably stable situations where the seasons may get messed up a bit, but nothing too ridiculous will happen. So our, our world that Westeros is on would be one of the first two? Probably one of the first two, because the third one really is not somewhere you could ever, ever have life. A lot of this is, again, about this issue of angular momentum. You've got your planet orbiting around, and if, if it's just going around a single star, nothing can change very much because angular momentum is conserved, which just means it has to keep going around. If you introduce a third body, you've got something you can kind of exchange angular momentum with. And so actually suddenly you have these possibilities that the thing can slow down and speed up because it can interact with the two stars. And so that's the reason why you can have these swings where it moves from, from one orbit to another and sometimes it's close to the star, sometimes it's far away. Professor, you get the feeling that if there were two suns blazing over Westeros, it would have come up in the books at some point. You would think it would get a mention somewhere along the line, which means that probably if there is a second star, it has to be very faint. And then, because then you would probably only reference the big star in the sky, the, the, your sun. Um, and if you had a second object, it could be a white dwarf star or maybe even a neutron star or one of these things called a brown dwarf, which wasn't quite massive enough to form, you know, start the nuclear fusion processes and really become a bright star itself. Then perhaps that's what's going on. And so they don't bother to mention it in the books because it's there, but it's just not that worthy of mention. It's not the thing that keeps you warm. But it's still, its gravitational influence is still there, so it's still going to mess up the orbits in this way. So, Professor, if there was a brown dwarf in the solar system that Westeros is located in, would they even see it or know about it? You probably would. You, I mean, there, there, you, if you had a, a white dwarf star which had really faded away completely, then perhaps you wouldn't notice it was there. Um, even that, you probably would if it was in your own stellar system, because even when it's faded right down, it's still glowing a little bit. But it just might not be something you would, you know, it's there, but it's just not very interesting to look at. It's not very bright, so it just doesn't doesn't get anything much of a mention. I like that candidate. <laughs> so as you're not the only one. So um, 
Um, so I, I noticed on the so in astronomy we have this this archive of preprints of places where people put their papers when they've written them, and on April first last year a paper appeared here it is which has the wonderful title of Winter is Coming and it was submitted for publication in the Old Town Journal of Evil Omens, and uh, so some serious astronomers wrote a not terribly serious paper in which they looked at what some of these possibilities were and they indeed, indeed did some rather careful calculations as to what you might happen. So they have set up, a, did a numerical simulation of putting a planet in orbit around a pair of stars and this is, uh, as you go forward in time, uh, what the maximum temperature is you get in summer and what the minimum temperature is you get in winter and how long winter goes on for and so on. And they were able to show that in these kind of systems you can have winters of variable length, winters of variable intensity in much the same way as you find uh, in the books. So the, this is at least a plausible explanation for what might be going on. It's not the world's most serious paper, I have to say, um, and the people who wrote it wrote it with their tongues firmly in their cheeks, but they did actually do the calculations properly, so it is actually a legitimate calculation from that point of view. Another astrophysical explanation, which wasn't in that paper and I hadn't actually seen anywhere else, is one of the ways that's completely different uh, from here on Earth, of making seasons vary, making the average temperature of your, your planet vary, is by making the brightness of the star that you're orbiting around vary with time. And again, one of the nice things about this is that there are indeed variable stars out there, and actually some of these variable stars do indeed display this phenomenon of chaos, that some of them vary in a very predictable way, but some of them vary really in completely unpredictable ways. And so that could be a very nice way of making seasons be completely unpredictable, that sometimes your star gets a little bit brighter and that warms everything up, sometimes it gets a little bit fainter and that cools everything down. Um, and that would sort of meet the bill rather nicely because it, it is completely unpredictable, it hasn't introduced any new physics along the way, um, and it's a way yeah, of actually making the seasons sort of come and go in a way that you really wouldn't be able to predict ahead of time. These variable stars do exist. Do they we do. Do you know why they vary? It, it varies. Uh, so some stars vary for one reason, some vary for another. Some of them it's because the whole star is pulsating. Um, in the case, you know, the sun varies in its output and that's to do with the solar cycle and that's this complicated thing to do with the way that the, the magnetic fields uh, are, are being generated within the star. And so, you know, when you have lots of sunspots, that actually makes the, the, the sun more active and actually a little bit brighter in the ultraviolet. Um, when it has fewer sunspots, it calms down a bit and you actually have less luminosity. Um, so it happens to our own, own sun. And in fact, you know, if you want, there's an example of this in this thing called the Mourn the Minimum that happened uh, some centuries ago, where for an extended period of time, the sunspot cycle of the uh, sun almost died. There were almost no sunspots to be seen. And at the same time, there was this thing called the Little Ice Age in Northern Europe. Lots of rivers froze over and snowfields stayed around all year round that usually melted and so on. And so and it's thought there was some link between this fairly small drop in the ultraviolet output from the sun that occurred in that more than minimum and these uh, extended icy period in northern Europe, which actually weren't the same, the rest of the world didn't have the same, same issues, but it's, so it's, sometimes it's quite geographically local, but they, 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 you can have this driving between the, what the star's doing and the atmosphere of the planet that it's impacting on and how that then affects the climate of the planet. So it's just an example of, I, this was a, struck me as, this is a particularly bizarre variable star just to give you an illustration of a variable star. So the plot at the top here shows what the brightness of this star is doing as a function of time. So, an, so there are years along the top here. It starts in 1993, goes through to 2012. So it's been followed for a fairly long period of time. And the variations in the early years they were monitoring this star, this bit here, is about a factor of 10 in brightness. This particular star was varying hugely by a factor of 10, so which is much more than you'd want actually to do the season. So this is a very extreme example of variability. And you can see it was varying on the right kind of time scale. You know, there was a couple of years when it was faint, a year when it was bright, a year when it was faint. But then the weird thing about this particular star is it stopped. And so you can have these very strange properties when you have these, these chaotic non-linear systems that they can be variable for a while and then that can just switch off. Um, and so you could imagine that a slightly less extreme version of this kind of phenomenon would produce exactly what we were wanting in terms of having a star that was output was varying over time in such a way that the, that output from the star was the thing that was generating the seasons. Is this it? Is this what you think is happening in Westeros world? This is my favourite. I mean, you know, it's a fictional place, right? So actually it could be anything at all. You can change the laws of physics if you want. Uh, but if you want a physical explanation as to how you could have a planet going around a star where the, the length of seasons were unpredictable, I will put my money on the variability of the star rather than anything else.
don't watch Game of Thrones, do you? I have been told I really ought to watch Game of Thrones several times um, and have not yet got around to doing it. And I understand I'm now quite a few seasons behind, so I've got some, got some homework to do, I guess. Nice pun over the season. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> but, you have, but you have watched the opening credits. But I do. So, yes. So, and in fact, I mentioned this to, to Megan Gray, one of our other contributors to these videos. Um, and she said, oh, well, it'll never work, because actually if you look at the opening credits of the TV series, the world is set up in this very strange way, right? You've got a star in the middle, and then you've actually got the world around it, kind of around the inside of a sphere. And um, so actually, you know, if you're going to start thinking about binary stars and all that kind of thing, it's never going to work. So clearly they really have changed the laws of physics in order to, get, to, to create this very strange world. But of course, my, my preferred solution, this variable star, still works, right? If you set up your world like that, if you've got a variable star in the middle, that's still going to illuminate the planet differently depending on how much output the star's producing. How do you get night time on a planet like that? That's an interesting question, isn't it? <laughs> well, there's, there's something uh, analogous to them, which is that when people are thinking about advanced civilizations, what happens as a civilization advances, there is this concept of a thing called a Dyson sphere, which is that eventually, if you advance to a certain stage, you actually want all the energy output your star can produce in order to, to, you know, to produce the energy you need for your civilization. So you end up building a sphere around these things to actually capture all that starlight. Um, and, uh, and your civilization then exists on the inside of this sphere. And one of the, so one of the ways people think about looking for very advanced civilizations is even if you completely surround your star, obviously the waste heat is still going to escape. So if you have a star that's, that's, you know, that's a civilization around a star in this state, what you'd actually see if you're an astronomer is you'd see no light anymore because that's all being captured. You'd just see the waste heat. So if you looked in the infrared, you might actually be able to find these things. So people who are looking for advanced civilizations have suggested this is a way for looking for them.